So, okay, so about two months ago, I made these videos. Um, I did it because I was trying to articulate my concerns. Um, you know, sometimes when you're having a debate or discussion with someone that you love and you're having a, a little argument about something, like who's going to do the dishes or something like that, or especially if you haven't been getting along very well with that person, you know how the discussion starts with something specific and then you start trading all the things that it might be about until you're arguing about, you know, the way that you behaved on your third date, you know, 10 years ago, and the whole underlying unresolved chaos of your relationship emerges through the little portal that was defined by the argument. You know, well, that's what this is about. And when you talk, it doesn't mean you're right, it doesn't mean you're correct, right? It means you're trying to articulate and formulate your thoughts like the boneheaded moron that you are. And you're going to stumble around idi idiotically, because what the hell do you know? You're full of biases and you're ignorant and you can't speak very well and you're over-emotional. And, you know, you've got just problems that you can hardly even imagine that are interfering with your ability to state something clear. And so what you do is you do your best to say what you mean, and then you listen to other people tell you why you're a blithering idiot. And hopefully you can correct yourself to some degree as a consequence of listening to them. And, you see, that's what free speech is about. It isn't just that people can, can organize themselves and their societies by thinking. You can't do that because there's only one of you. What you have to do is you have to articulate your thoughts in a public forum so that other people can attack you, and hopefully in a corrective manner. And then you want to, you know, step back a little bit and think, okay, well, you know, I was a little arrogant there, and I was a little over-emotional there, and I didn't get that quite right, and maybe I'm outright biased on that front. And, you, you want to correct what you say, because then you correct how you are, and then you correct how you act in life, and then you correct your society. And, and to the degree that we limit free freedom of expression, we put all of that at risk. And that's partly why I don't believe that freedom of speech is just another value. I think that's preposterous. I think that if you claim that, then you know nothing about Western civilization and history. Is freedom of speech is not just another principle. It's the mechanism by which we keep our psyches and our societies organized, and we have to be unbelievably careful about in infringing upon that because we're infringing upon the process by which we keep chaos and order balanced. The proper citizen is the person who embodies truth in speech and attempts to act it out. And that also includes listening because listening is part of communicative intent. And I think at the moment that we're, em we're embroiled in a war on every single one of those dimensions and several others that I haven't had time to list. And the, the evidence that we're in that sort of war is precisely the fact that this has attracted so much attention. I mean, I just sat in my bloody office at home and threw up a couple of amateurish videos, more or less attempting to articulate my feelings about a couple of policies, and it's like all hell broke loose. And why? Well, because that hell is right underneath the surface. I hate to... So I'm going to read you something that a graduate student sent me from the University of Toronto the other day, and I, I can also tell you that I've received hundreds of letters like this. Today, I had a tutorial at the University of Toronto where I talked about Jordan Peterson and issues of personal identity, legally sanctioned identity categories, etc. I brought up a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a university how they'd react if he told them he identified as a woman, as black, as short, and as five years old. Spoiler alert, students in the video resist some of the later categories a bit, but are mostly accepting. Still, students were not engaging in discussion. I asked them why. One said it was because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or saying something offensive. I asked who else was not speaking for that reason. The whole class put their hands up. No participation. Why? They weren't uninterested. They were afraid to speak their minds. The PC police are in your heads. I'll start with lawyer one, who was the counsel to several prime ministers. He talked to me about the Human Rights Tribunal because I went and saw him two weeks after this all started. Human Rights Tribunal is a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and it should be abolished as fast as possible. It's one of the many institutions in Canada that pose a threat to your, to your freedom that, that is of almost unimaginable proportions. Here's what this top lawyer told me. If I'm taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, it will cost me $250,000. I will pay the legal costs for my opponents, and I will lose. He said, go back to your safe little life and shut your mouth. Second lawyer told me, 
my critique of the Ontario Human Rights Commission is spot on. And absent the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has these contradictions built into it that you just heard described, much of what I was saying was illegal and has been illegal since 2012. Lawyer 3 told me that if I breached a tribunal order, so imagine I was taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal and I was fined and then I refused to, to pay the fine, which I've stated that I would do. That equals contempt of court, which inevitably means jail until the contempt is purged. The social justice tribunals and the SJWs, social justice warriors who staff them, have a rogue nature. They can search your house without a warrant. They can use secret hearings. There are no rules of evidence and the judges are unaccountable. But those are legal opinions. Let's, let's look at a real world case. Let's look at what happened when I made my videos. Let's look at how the university responded because I can tell you in the video I said, look, what I'm doing is probably illegal and worse, my employer is legally responsible for it because that's built, in, that's built into the codes as well. So by the way, if you're an employer, you're responsible for everything that your employees say and everything that in anybody interprets what they said as being, whether it's unintentional or intentional, whether or not a complaint has been made. So just think about that. Anyways, October 3rd, the university said, like all members of the university community, I have an obligation to comply with the law, including the provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Their policy with regards to workplace harassment, which the university implied that I was engaging in, engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct, where the course of comment or conduct is known, or ought reasonably be known to be unwelcome. The university reviewed my videos and they decided that what I said was true. They decided that the video I made was probably illegal and that they were responsible for it. And so in an attempt to distance themselves from me, under counsel from their legal people, and believe me, the university has good legal people, they sent me a warning. And this is what happens if you want to discipline a recalcitrant employee, essentially, so that you don't have to bear legal responsibility for their acts. So on October 18th, the university mentioned to me in another warning letter that if personal pronouns are being used, the refusal to use the personal pronoun that is an expression of the person's gender identity can constitute discrimination. So now, you see what's happened is that I haven't refused to use someone's gendered, uh, gender neutral pronouns. I said that I would refuse. So it's not even the refusal itself that's producing the letters. It's my declared intent to engage in the refusal. And as far as I was concerned, what I was essentially doing was criticizing a piece of legislation that had not yet been passed. But the university's legal department decided that all that was sufficient for them to distance themselves from me and to engage in disciplinary activity. I would say a, a, a legal doctrine is something like a virus and it has a life. If you, if That's you let not it, what we think. If you, if you let it go into a living system, it, it propagates and it has effects and the effects are a consequence of the philosophy that's embedded inside the law. And if you really want to know about this, you should read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago because what he does in that book is tell you how the hypothetically humane doctrines that were embedded in radical Marxism at the end of the 1800s unfolded into Soviet society and demolished it. But I want to tell you a little bit about what the law does. And this is with regards to its uh, interpretation from the policy guidelines. It instantiates social constructionism into our legal system. You have to understand what that means. There's a huge debate about how human identity is, is, is um, upon what grounds human identity is predicated. Now, the radical social constructionists basically say that identity is nothing but a social construction, and that, that's in keeping with their philosophical doctrines, partly Marxist and partly, partly postmodern. But that isn't, and that was what I was objecting to with regards to Bill C-16, because it insists, do you understand this? It makes this legal doctrine that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation vary independently. And they don't. Now, the reason they don't is because 98% of people, it's 99.7% of people, by the way, at least with regards to the most credible statistics, have a gender identity that's essentially identical with their biological sex. And almost everybody who is male and female by biological sex and gender identity dresses that way, and that's what it, gender expression essentially is. And then, if you stack those three things on top of each other, they're basically isomorphic, you can add sexual orientation to that and 98% of people are heterosexual so the idea that those things vary independently is absolutely preposterous but it's written into the law and that has terrible consequences you see I don't know for example now 
to what degree any discussion in universities of the biological differences between men and women are legal. And you think, oh well, that's an exaggeration. It's like, well, they, I debated Nicholas Matt, I believe that was his name, a professor at the University of Toronto on TVO's The Agenda. And he said right out for everyone to hear that the scientific consensus is that there's no biological differences between men and women. And I've received letters from people who've told me that now the social justice activist types are complaining about the fact that the biologists assign biological sex to animals because it's only a social construct that we're projecting onto their being. And, um, you know, we just heard that the, cr the chromosomal level of analysis is complex. It's not that complex. What we have is a bimodal distribution with a tiny number of exceptions, and that, by the way, is not a spectrum. And one of the things it builds in, for example, is the claim that identity is only subjectively defined. And that's built right in. It says that. Your identity is whatever you think it is. Well, let me tell you, as a practicing psychologist, that's absolute rubbish. Your identity, to, look, when, when children are two years old, that's what they think. They think that their subjective reality is everything. And what you do is you socialize them between the ages of two and four to adopt uh, an identity that's part of a cultural negotiation. It's like your identity is part of a cultural negotiation. It's partly the game you play and partly the game that I play with you. And I have to be a voluntary participant in that. And not only, not only is it not subjectively defined, which detaches it entirely, by the way, from the underlying biological and the underlying objective reality, making any claim you want for your subjective identity valid. The other thing it does, it, it completely obliviates the idea that identity is actually a pra pragmatic entity, for God's sake. It's like if you're a lawyer or a father or a mother, like an identity that has some solidity to it. Your identity is also a vehicle within which you travel through life, right? It's a set of tools, a set of pragmatic tools that you use to interact with the social and the natural world. It's not only your subjective whim. The idea of gender identity, which is only defined subjectively in the relevant law, has been studied intensively by personality psychologists such as myself. In fact, my lab has done some of the, I wouldn't say the most fundamental research on it, but, you know, we're in the, ball, and we're in the ballpark. Here's a little story. Okay, so... The, the differences between personality between men and women are basically what constitutes gender identity in, insofar as it's not merely subjective. And one of the things that's happened is that as the Scandinavian countries have equalized their political and sociological landscape, the differences in identity between men and women have got larger, not smaller. Do you understand that? That's a refutation of the social constructionist claim. So what happens is that if you flatten out the landscape so that there are very few socioeconomic differences, say, or sociological differences in the treatment between men and women, what happens is the biological difference maximizes. It maximizes. Do you understand? That means men and women get more different, not more the same. And the thing about women in the audience, bloody hell, you should think about this because don't you want to pursue the things that you're interested in? And if you pursue the things that you're interested in, because you're interested in different things than men, I'm telling you. And if you look at the interest, if you look at the interest variation, this has been established technically. If you look at the interest variation, there's almost no overlap between men and women. If you sum up the differences in so inter interest and temperament, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Professor Peterson, let's start with you. Uh, so this question says, um, you present your issue with Bill C-16 to be that the infringement of freedom of expression regarding gender pronouns is a problem. Do you hold the same stance with other discriminatory language in the Human Rights Code, such as being able to use uh, racist uh, terms uh, with regard to students? And if you believe that one of these things is a violation but not the other one, why? I'm not sure I read that out okay. all that yeah. well, but yeah. you get the idea. Okay, well, well, first of all, I don't think that these issues are the same. I don't think they're the same at all. I mean, I've think, been thinking about the pronoun thing, you know, because one of the things that people... Uh, it put me back on my heels for a while because the claim was basically, well, it's something like, why doesn't the mean professor just play nice and, and respect people by using their pronouns? And it took me like three weeks to unpack that because... Who gets questioned about pronoun use? I don't know why the hell I use the pronouns I use. I use them because they're part of the language. I use he and she because that's what everyone uses. And so then I had to think about, well, why, why do we, in fact, use pronouns? And we use them in part for the same reason that we use other categories, and that's to simplify the world for functional purposes, roughly speaking. 
But then I was thinking, well, is the use of he and she a mark of respect? And the answer to that is, well, no, it's not a mark of respect. It can't be a mark of respect. What you call four billion people can't be a mark of respect, right? It's a, it's a mark of basic categorization. And so then the claim comes up, well, if someone wants you to use a particular pronoun, then you're disrespecting them if you don't. It's like, hmm, okay, let's think that through a bit. Well, that assumes that when I'm using he or she for, for people in, you know, in normal parlance, that I'm actually indicating my respect for them. And that's not true. It's like, if I don't know you, I class classify you generically, and basically I classify you in terms of how you present yourself publicly. I suppose that's your gender expression. And then I nail you with whatever pronoun seems to fit. It has nothing to do with respect. And besides that, you bloody well don't get to demand my respect. Why should you? You know, I mean, it's not like I respect everyone. That's a foolish thing to do. You respect people who are respectable. You know, you, you make value distinctions between people, and that doesn't mean you illegally discriminate against them. Those aren't the same thing. But I'm all for value judgments. So don't tell me that I'm not respecting people when I don't use their gendered pronouns. And the other thing is, I don't buy this whole idea that the people who are putting this legislation forward are valid representatives of the trans community. That's what they say they are. We have mechanisms for deciding whether someone's a valid representative of a community, and that generally involves democratic voting. I've received at least 20 letters from transsexual people who are on my side, and by the way, zero from others, believe it or not, who are perfectly happy with the idea of gendered pronouns. It's just they want to be the other one. Now, you can have a discussion about that, and there's lots of things to be said about it, but the idea that this community that's coming out and these, demanding these rights is somehow representative of this homogenous oppressed minority, I think, is rubbish. Is Professor Peterson, sorry, um, as a clinical psychologist, refusing to acknowledge how damaging it could potentially be to an individual to disregard their identity? I, it's a very difficult question to even engage with because I don't understand it's... I don't understand it. It makes things so simple that you can't discuss them properly. All I do in my clinical practice, and I have about 20,000 hours of experience with clinical, in my clinical practice, and I've dealt with all sorts of people, far more variation in people than the typical person ever encounters, and I think I've done it at least reasonably, competently. All my discussions with people in my clinical practice are about their identity, given the definition of identity that I brought forth, how they feel about themselves, how they conceptualize themselves, because those are two different things, how that plays out in their interactions with other people, and what the functional significance of that is. And I'm, I'm going to say forthrightly, well, two things. One is that I don't believe that any of my clients have had cause to worry about my interpretation of their identity because what I do in my practice is help them discover what that is. I'm really, I'm seriously not interested in imposing any ideas of identity onto someone because I don't, I can't do that. I don't know what the right vehicle is for you to travel through life. What I can help you do is articulate your concerns. I can ask you questions where I see contradictions in your self-articulation. I can help you make plans for the future. And I've helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people, by the way, make plans for the future with the stuff that I do online. And so I'm helping people build a genuine identity. Um, well, and that's what I do. So uh, that's the answer to that question. And, and I think I do it well. I mean, in, in the stuff we've done from a research perspective with the Future Authoring Program, which I offered to people free a week and a half ago to help them catalyze their identities, we've helped 5,000 university students increase their grade point average 20% and decrease their dropout by the same. And the biggest effect has been with men and, and non-Western ethnic minority students who've accelerated their performance up beyond the range of the normal for the for the dominant culture a pure psychological intervention I might say and not a sociological intervention so I'm perfectly willing to stack my record on identity formulation up against anyone's and and so and I should also point out that I think where I'm most vulnerable in this entire debate and I expect this will happen and you know there's already been noise about it on the Ontario Psychological Association website I think they'll that they'll probably come after my clinical license so that, that'd, be my, that'd be my guess. So, so I think we might be straying a little away from yeah, the question well, now. So well. uh, just uh, thank you. Um, so, um, no, no, we're not, because that, that, question, that question involved my clinical practice. I'm not straying a bit. That involved my clinical practice, and there was a reason that the question was posed. So I'm not straying. Thank you. Why do you feel that someone's personal gender identity and pronouns infringes your free speech? 
can one not also argue based on your interpretation that professors can use racial slurs in their classroom um, and the, that the inability to do so would violate their freedom of speech? Well, that's pretty much the same question, I think. Um, I think that we're crossing a dangerous line and the line is the requirement that's being put upon people by government agencies with the full force of the law behind them to decide what language categories you're going to use. When I opened this debate, this forum, um, I tried to explain what this is about and I couldn't explain everything that it's about because it's about too many things. But one of the things it's about is ideology and the distinction between the left and the right. And let's say, now, I truly believe that these made up pronouns, of which there are many, dozens in fact, and there's no consensus on them. I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the. I don't think there's any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference between, hear I'm want. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. <laughs>